seat two. Elmo and Sua. Seat four. Intermediate Groveland, Mike Smith, District Four. Senior Miniola, Paul, Jack Alone. <laughs> Joe Saunders, C5. Uh, Nick Jerome is just now. No. 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 <laughs> That's not him. He's on his way. Nick Jerome from, uh, from Mount Dora. From the city of Tiberias, David Boylston. Lou Guegas, C2. James, let me know if I get this right. Sweeza, you got it. C2. C2. Walter Price, C2. Troy Singer, C4. And this is Alan Hartle. Now we begin with the candidate introductions. Again, I'd like to remind the audience. Do we have a candidate? <laughs> Nick is here. Very good. Come on up. I just introduced you. <laughs> Nick, we got you a seat and everything. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. Nick, Nick yeah, told me you was. We had a schedule conference tonight. They were doing a walk over there. It's an outdoor tonight and uh, commemorating the 9 11 tragedy. So I was there with them for a while tonight. So I apologize for being late. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. It's 25 bucks to you. <laughs> <laughs> Silence your cell phone if you could, please. And also, everyone needs to speak loudly because we've got a, a, a big room and, and we want to make sure everybody can hear everyone, even those guys that are hard to hear like me. What? <laughs> Very good. Again, I'd like to remind the audience that as we can go through our our candidate introductions, if you would like to ask a question of a candidate, use the index card that's on your table there and let Francesca and Sam know. Just raise your hand and they'll, they'll come and grab your question. Thank you. Now we'll allow each candidate two minutes for introductions and comments on how they intend to advance the principles of limited government, free enterprise, personal liberty, personal responsibility, and what I've done is I've gone in, in alphabetical order by city and by candidate last name. So I'm going to begin with the city of Claremont, Joe Gustafson, seat two. You have two minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you folks. I don't think I can cover that topic in two minutes, but I'll do my best. Uh, I've been in Central Florida about 20 years, 21 going over six. I'm a graduate of the State University of New York Maritime College with a Postgraduate license, a double major in meteorology and oceanography, um, and an ensign in the United States Naval Reserve. I spent four years sailing. I spent about 25, 26 working for New York Telephone. When I left, I was managing director of all business market development. I then was asked to join a consulting firm when I took an early retirement package as a CEO and managing partner. I did that for a bunch of years. I wanted to do uh, some public service and volunteering work. I've been doing that for quite a while. Uh, I was chairman of a 501c3 foundation that raised money for about a million dollars in 15 years for about 16, 17 local charities. The last seven years, we raised money and built mortgage-free homes for disabled veterans and their families. We built the house, paid the key, and paid the mortgage. Uh, since that time, I've done an awful lot of charity work and volunteer work. As far as supporting the mission, absolutely. I'm 100% in favor of what you folks are trying to do. I don't think it's going to be easy to accomplish. The implementation of that mission, I think, needs a lot more work and time. And the reason is, as the generations change, and instant gratification becomes part of that lower, the younger generation issue, it's tougher to get them to be accountable. Um, I'm not sure I can get any deeper than that with only 30 seconds left. Suffice it to say, if I'm elected to the city council in Claremont, people who apply for applications for buildings and other changes 
they will be held accountable at least to following the rules that exist at the time. That's their job. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
I sailed for about six years, then I went to the Coast Guard active duty for the next 25 years. Uh, I got a chance to see most of the United States uh, from inside and out. Uh, and I worked for private industry for a while, then uh, started my own business, a small business owner, still run that, uh, occasional job between my council gigs. And I started and ran for council two years ago, one and unopposed this year, so I don't have an opponent run against me. But the things I pushed for, and the reason I came into it was because what I saw was the dysfunction that was going on within the city of Grove, at least at that time, for those that are local. Probably remember that I asked for a transparent, I want to see transparency, which we didn't see, and I think that a government in the sunshine is really a good thing for us, and it's going to make us all better. I wanted to see us start to move towards the model of excellence. How do we become the better the example for all the others? How do we do the best that we can do. Smart growth, we hear that all the time, but there is a way of how you can preserve the environment, how you can preserve the, the things that you like about an area, and at the same time, grow your city, grow your citizens. So along those lines this year, probably the big focus that we're gonna to look to try and do is just to start doing some master plans. Master plans for our parks and recreation, master plans for our land use, master plans for water, wastewater, and stormwater and stuff. So, Having a chance to go out there in the community and engage the community and develop these master plans will allow us to better understand what the community is looking for, understand what is important to our citizens, and to be responsive and, and, and to them in their needs. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight and to uh, talk with you and be with you. So thank you very much. From the city of Mineola, Paul, Jack Lone, Jack Lone, seat five. Paul Giacalone, G-I-A-C-A-L-O-N-E, Giacalone. So Giacalone. I, I still have problems with it myself. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm from, originally from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and don't hold that against me. It's a, it's a great place to live. It really was when I was growing up. And uh, I moved here in, in 2009. I've been in uh, Doran Hardware for about 20 years. Uh, I was a locksmith. I did access control. I installed doors. Uh, kind of life safety stuff. And uh, that was before I was, uh, after I was a, uh, an options trader on the floor at the uh, Four World Trade Center in New York. I, I traded options on six features. Uh, moving along uh, in the door and hardware industry uh, in uh, 2007, 2008, uh, the uh, market was declining. My business wasn't doing so well. So I closed it up and I moved here to Lake County, which was the greatest thing I ever did in my life. <coughs> Lake County is a wonderful place to live. I love it here. And uh, my kids, uh, the schools are absolutely fantastic. Um, I took a job with the Lake County School Board uh, as their locksmith for about seven years. And uh, I did it as a servant because I was getting paid for $12.78 an hour. Uh, and I love doing it. I loved every minute of helping the teachers, helping the, the students, being involved. That was my that was my thing. I wanted to be involved with the, with the community. I didn't just want a job and, and be able to uh, to make money. It didn't, mean, it didn't mean anything to me. What meant something to me was to serve and to do, to do well. I'm also very active in my church. I play guitar. I, uh, I sing. I, uh, I love the Lord. Uh, the first thing I would like to do in Mineola is bring prayer back. What you did tonight was wonderful. Um, praying before the Pledge of Allegiance is, is a wonderful thing because we really need to have our hearts right with God. And, and no matter what God you are, you, you serve, or whatever God you worship, that's your business. I worship Jesus. Six Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Joseph Saunders, seat five. Good evening. Good evening. I've been uh, Mineola's city councilman on seat five for the last ten years. Uh, I ran for council the first year because Mineola had a lot of problems. I don't know whether you all have been here long enough to know that, but we were in the newspapers all the time. We had people on TV all the time. We had uh, the fire department shut down, and I won't go on and on, but our police department and our fire department, and everything is pretty much straightened out now. We've come a long way in the last 10 years. <clears throat> the city's running well. A, in the first year, we had to reduce the staff of the city. We were way over staff. We reduced it by almost 30%. We cut $2 million out of the budget to keep the city from going into financial bankruptcy. In fact, over the years, we've done several things to keep our taxes the same. We, we don't raise taxes. 
and we uh, we believe we have a crime safe city. We have the lowest crime rate in South Lake County, and we have the highest education rate in all of Lake County. So we do our best to make Mineola the best city it can be. For my part, I come from a long line of engineering. I worked for a company for 42 years. I was a sergeant in the Army and uh, a professional musician at one time. And uh, I do my best to keep Mineola as pure and simple as it can be. My background is engineering, primarily. I was an engineering manager for a high-tech company that made uh, equipment for semiconductor manufacturing. That sounds like very technical, but it takes a lot to explain. <clears throat> but all in all, I love Mineola, and I'll do anything for it. Thank you. City of Mount Dora, Mayor Nick Jerome. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Just a little bit about myself. Um, came from New Jersey and uh, Bowen, New Jersey. It's also one of those little uh, uh, Philadelphia area cities, but it's in New Jersey. And uh, came, came here in 2010. And uh, my background, I have a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Management. Worked 10 years in, uh, as an Industrial Engineer with Cincinnati Militron and um, Moser Safe Company when I was out in the Midwest. Uh, I got a, a, a master's degree from um, Glassboro State College, which is now Rowan University. And, uh, so Rowan gave me also a master's degree in that also. So I got two of them, but no, it's actually one thing, but they both gave me one at the same time. So I got that, and I've worked uh, about uh, 16 years as a, not work, or maybe say work, as a school board member in uh, Bowen, New Jersey. I have 16 plus years as a school board member. <laughs> plus 20-some years as a uh, school business administrator. That's where my master's is at in school business administration. So with that, I came to um, Mount Dora and to be retired. And uh, that lasted about not even two years. And in 2012, I ran for city council. And I beat one of the incumbents at the time for that large seat of Vasco Waters. And I re-ran again in 2014. And uh, that was the election, if you guys remember, it ended in a dead tie. Uh, that year, and I lost uh, to a hat draw to Marie Rich, and uh, and that's what kind of got me into running for the um, uh, for the mayor's, uh, mayor's position because it was open that year, the following year, 2015, and I had three choices, so I decided to run for mayor. Uh, being the mayor, I tr really tried to uh, work on three things: uh, to transparency and um, uh, accountability. Communications and also doing all the work for the you know, for the residents of the city, make sure that they are treated as number one. Uh, with that, we try to stabilize our tax rate, and we do that by doing looking at our economic development that we have going throughout the whole city. So, with that, thank you. I'll take some questions later. Thank you. Now to the city of Tiberias, David Boylson, seat two. Hi, uh, my name's David, obviously. Uh, and I can say that this is actually my first rodeo. So I don't get to say that too often, but I'm not really, I'm pretty new to this. Um, but uh, my father, when he was in uh, law school in Stetson, uh, his law professor uh, told him to come and check out Lake County to start his uh, family. He said that when you come to Lake County and you are good to Lake County, Lake County is good to you. And I have found this to be one of the most true statements I've ever heard in my entire life. This place is truly a treasure, and I want to uh, keep that going to the best of my abilities. Um, uh, I'm a fiscal conservative, downright to the bottom, uh, and uh, I believe in um, <coughs> excuse me. I believe in uh, uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, making sure that we don't have to. Um, subsidize the growth of the city by uh, paying for, uh, or I'm sorry, using the growth uh, to cost the city money by, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry guys, I'm not good at this, uh, I just started. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't, basically my point is this, um, I want to try as hard as I can to do the right thing, and I believe that um, the fiscal responsibility and 
understanding what we're talking about with, with making the correct decisions for the future is very important. And I think everyone knows that. But I plan on staying here my whole life, and I plan on raising kids here and a family. And I'm very excited to be here, and I'm very glad you guys love to talk to you. So, thank you. Lou Buegas, C2. Good evening. Thank you all for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule to come here. It's great to see some friends in the crowd and some family and some alumni from our 2015 Leadership Lake cl uh, class, Ben Boylston and Chief Broadway. Um, why am I running for Tiberi City Council? Well, it, it's pretty simple. Um, during tough economic years, the city of Tiberi has afforded me the opportunity to open a business. And um, as a result of that, um, giving back to the community I love has become a priority and has led me to run for city council. Um, my business uh, background, my business foundation, my commitment to my community and my community um, involvement will be an asset to the city. Wanting what's best for Tiberi uh, unites us. Uh, my commitment, tenacity, and work ethics set me apart from my other candidates. And I hope to earn the vote of the city of Tiberias voters that are in the audience tonight. Thank you. James Sweezer, seat two. Thank you. Like David, I'm new to the rodeo. But thank you for having me here. I grew up in Michigan. Spent 25 years in Cleveland, Ohio. I was a textbook buyer at two colleges and for a lot of industry. I have a background in industrial development, community development, and a minor in urban yeah. studies. Yeah, explain the prior. Let me, let me correct my education a little bit. It's called Industrial Occupational Sociology and Pentecology with an emphasis on small business management. So I just charge it up. <laughs> I believe in fiscal responsibility. Wait, wait, wait. Just don't hear this guy. I believe that firmly. I'd like to see us continue to lower our building rate, and as our community grows, that would give us more funding, and hopefully we don't have to raise our taxes, hopefully we can lower them. I'd like to see us have moderate development, this development that benefits the city. I like our hometown atmosphere downtown and the fact that all of our chains are living on the outskirts of town. Um, I want to see our downtown enhanced and our waterfront, which has been torn up for a couple years. Getting it, I'm looking forward to getting it back on track and making it recreational, functional for the city. I think that's about it. Short and to the point. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Glad y'all can make it tonight to listen to the candidates. Um, I showed up. My name is Robert Wolf. I was born in Orlando, Florida. Moved up here as a youngster with my family. Uh, graduated from Tavares High School, after which I joined the Marine Corps. After that, I came back to Tavares, started a family, started my own business. I still have that business today, a construction company that I own, and I'm proud of that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve on the Tiberi City Council for a little over eight years, a little over six years as mayor in the past. And um, with the city, then, we did a lot of good things. The city grew quite, quite a bit. I was glad to be part of it. I was glad to help implement uh, and impact the exemption. We talk about limited government. We exempted at that point $1.8 million of impact fees and it created over $50 million worth of new construction. That's a significant amount, and that helped during the recession. A lot of people saved business, you know, staying working, pay bills, and expanded the city to various greatly. And I'm part, glad to be part of that. Um, so when you look at it, you know, limited government, some things of that come to nature. Uh, you know, and also you have talking about some of your goals, some free enterprise, personal liability, per personal liberty, personal responsibility. I believe property rights are huge for different individuals who want to you know, develop their land if they want to. They should have that right without restrictions. The restrictions are already there with uh, future land use like fellow uh, cons 
that's what I figured that. So um, I look forward to getting back on the city council and seeing the city of the areas move forward in a positive way. And once again, thank you all for showing up. Walter Price, seat four. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. And uh, give you a little background. I've lived in Tiberias now for almost 40 years. Uh, I've raised my children here. I'm raising some of my grand. I'm not raising my children. I'm raising grandchildren here. Uh, my children went to the Tiberias school system, and I've owned my own business here for 27 years. And Tiberias is just the place that I intend to call home for the rest of my life. Um, I have served in the past. Uh, I was the chairman of the CRA committee for the city of Tiberias before the city council disbanded that committee. Um, because, I'll tell you why they did it, uh, they, the city, as they do now, they present a lot of stuff to the city councils and the various boards and they expect them to just rubber stamp it. And we wouldn't rubber stamp some of the stuff. Uh, some of the stuff they wanted to do was very unfeasible, and uh, their solution was to get rid of the committee. So, uh, the, uh, as far as myself, I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, I'm very fiscal conservative. Um, I have conservative values. I've always had conservative values. I've been a registered Republican my whole life. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, I do represent you. Uh, I am currently the chairman of the Republican Party for Lake County. And uh, we have about a 30,000 voter registration of Republicans over Democrats in this county, which I'm very happy of and I want to keep it growing. Um, as far as um, limited government, the cities are just out of control with their regulations. Uh, the other day, the, the city council was presented an item of $16,000. They were going to have $16,000 extra dollars in what they want to do and spend with it. And they said, well, why don't we repair the roads? All right. All right, well, I'll be glad to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Price for your seat four. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, I just want to let you know I've been a part of this community for well over 40 years now. I graduated from Tiberius High School. I went on to Lake Sucker Community College. I got my degree in business finance from UCF. My uh, wonderful wife and I, we uh, have been married for 21 years. We're currently raising our 20 or our 16-year-old son. He's a junior at Tiberius High School. We're very proud of him. After a bicycle accident that left me paralyzed when I was 14 years old, the people of this, uh, Lake County, they came together and they helped me and my family. They raised funds to help me purchase a wheelchair accessible van. The community has given so much to me and my family. I've never forgotten this, and that's why I really enjoy serving this community. I've served on the Tavares City Council for the past three years. During this time, I've gained valuable experience. Experience that I will build on as I continue to serve this great city. During my time on the council, our city tax rate have decreased while maintaining a high level of service and ensuring that our infrastructure is well taken care of for generations to come. This year, I'm proud to say that Tiberias had the largest millage decrease of any other city in the entire county. And while absorbing higher costs due to the fact that costs do go up every year, we have been able to increase reserves, increase road paving funding, take care of the hardworking employees, and we are able to replace them overused or a, a much needed playgrounds we've had for several years. I also am a strong supporter of businesses coming to Berries. We provide the amenities that businesses are looking for. With a strong business community that helps keep our tax rates lower. According to our very own property appraiser, Tiberias added the most new commercial buildings in 2019. 24 in Tiberias, followed by 21 in Claremont. I had a conversation recently with a business owner, and he was very happy with the way things are going in Tiberias, and I want to keep us moving forward. So please remember to always say your Thank you very much. All right, to the town of Montverde, Alan Hartle, council member. Good evening, one and all. I'm Alan Hartle. I was born and raised in Claremont. 
Wow, 61 years. I've seen the change. I'm third generation citrus, or was until the freezes of 85. My grandparents used to talk about how Highway 50 was a horse and buggy Model T. It didn't exist. So I know a lot about Montverde. I know a lot about Tiberias and Lake County. I'm a resident. I got my feet wet in politics because of my mother. My mother was in unincorporated Lake County and down in Claremont. And she went to Claremont City Council, Maniola, Montverde, and she became a regular pitcher, pitcher of those communities before the freezes of 83, and we watched the developments of South Lake County explode. Uh, I enjoy where I'm at. I was one of the dirty dozens, as we call them in our town of Montbird, those 12 who show up every council meeting, whether you need to or not. So I was sitting there, and we had a, a issue on the town of Lake County going on about adult entertainment, and it was passed by our council what we were going to do. So I made this comment, well, why don't we just, all of our new developments have a thousand, has to be a thousand foot buffer. And I said, why don't we make all of our new developments that come in town mandatory park? So you go a thousand feet from there, so it'll never happen. And my mayor says, that's a great idea. You ought to be on P and Z. And I said, I'm going to think about it. He goes, no, I'll write your name down. You're on P and Z. <laughs> so I was on P and Z for two years. Enjoyed it. I learned all those acronyms about PUDs and everything else. So it's been interesting. My, uh, one of our incumbents became very critical ill and has since passed away. I was asked by the council to fill the slot. I said, Okay, I will. Been unopposed the last two council runs. I enjoy it. One of the things we've done in Lake County, in our part of Lake County, we changed our development to one little word from gross to net. You will not build in Montbird on anything less than a half acre. We're the first in the city. The state has done that, and it's made a big difference. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right, I'd like to thank all the candidates. Now we're going to enter into our audience questions. <laughs> the candidates will be given one minute to answer. And here's a question that goes to the, any of the candidates from the city of Claremont. And the question is this. The 2018 millage rate ranges from 3.3 to 9.7. Explain the prior millage rates for your city for the last three years and how you compare to the other 13 cities in the county, either defend or def either defend the new proposed millage or explain why millage needs to be reduced versus other cities. And any of the Claremont candidates can begin for one minute. I went by default. I am happy to say that Claremont's proposed budget for the upcoming year is the same as it's been for five years, millage rate wise. Think about that. Five years with the growth that you all know that Claremont has experienced and all the demands that growth puts on infrastructure, and yet they still have been able to hold the millage rate at the same level. It's true, with all the growth comes new taxable base, of course, and that has been the savior, really. Or Claremont. Each year the reserves have been increased. Each year, I'm happy to say the police and fire, uh, which are near and dear to my heart personally, have always been supported 100% by the council and by the budget. And this year, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the budget contains cameras for every officer on the street. Um, I'm proud of Claremont and I'm proud of how they have conducted themselves fiscally up until now. It's my goal to see that that continues. Thank you. If I could, I apologize for not standing up, but I'm stuck in this chair with wheels. Um, Speak up, Joe. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to add to what Jim said, and I, it's just a compliment for the existing city council and the people who run Claremont. That accomplishment of maintaining that village rate comes from trying to balance the almost exponential growth in both population and business. And they've been able to do that, and this is not a feather in my cap because I know what this game, but I think it is a feather in their cap, and I'm proud to be a member of the Claremont Citizenry because I think they've done a magnificent job of accomplishing that goal. It's not easy to do. Thank you, Joe. 
Very good. That same question from the audience goes to the city of Tavares. So who in the city of Tavares would like to respond to that question? I'll read it again. 2018 millage rates range from 3.3 to 9.7. Explain the prior millage rates for your city for the last three years and how you compare to the other 13 cities in the county. Either defend the new proposed millage or explain why millage needs to be reduced versus other cities. I'll start with that. <laughs> like I said before, I'm very proud of the city of Tavares. Our council had a priority this year, and that was to reduce the millage. And that's exactly what we did. And like I said, the city of Tavares reduced their millage by the largest decrease of any other city in the entire county. And that's something that I'm very, very proud of. That this shows the fiscal responsibility that I have and our city council has, and I want to see that continue. It is true that Tiberius is proposing to lower their millage rate by 2% this year. But that's going up against a 9% increase in property value. So the net result is we're getting a tax increase in Tiberius. And their budget this year increased 60% from last year's budget. So I also did an analysis on the tax bill. And if you take Tiberius out of your tax bill, each year our taxes have gone up about 1% a year if you take all the county's uh, groups of taxes. Tiberius by itself has gone up an average of 3.3% per year in taxes. So my question is, are the citizens of Tiberius getting three times the amount of benefits that everybody else is, because they're certainly paying three times the amount. Thank you, Walter. Well, good, that's it. You know, I'm glad to see the city of Tiberias this past year and reduce their military. Yes, there's still an increase, minor in taxes. I do that. I mean, my property tax for the city of Tiberias went up $5.19 this year. I'm like, sure that's, that's minor to me. One thing that the city of Tiberias has to absorb, though, is all the Lake County buildings that don't pay anything that are in downtown Tiberias. City taxpayers get hit three times for fire service. When you think about it, they pay the cities, they have to find, they have to do county buildings, they get a small number back, not full, and then when the taxes that city residents also pay to the Lake County general fund through their taxes, the general fund helps subsidize the Lake County fire assessment tax that doesn't cover all the expenses. So the city of Tiberias tax will go up a little bit this year, if it just figures out whatever they vote on, but it's still less than what the millage is less, the taxes more, no doubt. It would be nice to see it drop more, but there's a lot of things that still have to take place. Infrastructure needs to be redone. It's been time on the roads a long time. Thank you, Robert. I'd like to take the issue regarding the, uh, the budget going up 60%. The budget went up 60 percent, but, but so did the revenue and the expenses also went up because that includes redoing the docks, which we're getting um, insurance reimbursement for that, um, and the Wonderland, and there's certain other things on there. So it did not go up 60 percent. Thank you, Lou. Anyone else from Tavares? Yes, David. Um, I think it's incredibly important to keep the military rate low because we know that um, what makes Tavares great specifically, I think is that the people in it, and I don't want the people in Tiberias to be priced out of Tiberias over time. And I certainly don't want to find a new home, and I want to make sure that I can afford to live in the city I want. So, thank you. Thank, if, thank you, David. If I can, I kind of agree with Robbie, because my taxes went up $5 according to the notice, $5.50. I think it's important that we keep building our infrastructure and keep lowering our millage rates and taking care of our empty properties because we have to. But we're controlling what's going up. Property value goes up. I can't help that. It's what happens. It happens throughout Lake County. It just happens that where we're at, my value, property value, didn't go up as much as everybody else's, but I'll pay it to make my city a better place. Thank you, James. Anyone else from Tavares on that question? 
If so. not, I'll move on to the next question. This question is directed at Walter Price from the audience. Here it goes. It says, how do you plan to lead the Republican Party of Lake County in the upcoming presidential election while doing your duties as a city council member? <laughs> well, uh, I guess a simple response to that is multitasking. Uh, I mean, I'm currently uh, running my own business, uh, and I happen to be busier than I've been in 33 years right now. Uh, I'm, I'm campaigning for the Tiberias City Council, and I'm running the party, um, and I'm getting it all done. Uh, I'm, not having, I'm not falling behind on any of the things I have to do my obligations. Um, the election is November 5th. That's coming right up. So uh, once the, uh, the council is seated on uh, November 5th, they meet twice a month. I know they have other liaison activities they do, but uh, it won't be as much time as I'm even devoting now campaigning. I mean, this is my third event today, and so uh, you know, I've just I've always worked hard, continue to work hard. Thank you, Walter. Our next question, and this could go to any candidate who's willing to answer it from the audience. <laughs> They'll all stand up. <laughs> it says, what is the most pressing issue facing your city? Okay. Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, um, besides working for Lake, Lake County Schools, I now work for the Orange County Fire Marshal Office. I'm a fire inspector, uh, certified by the state. And, and you know, we have black safety code. And a lot of the uh, communities that are going in have very narrow streets. And there's a possibility that we can't get a fire truck down. Uh, so here, here are some of the issues that we're, we're facing in many all the way. No people are parking on the streets. Uh, we're, we're building homes that are uh, 50 feet wide, uh, a lot. There, there's six bedrooms in one home, six bedrooms in the other home. I mean, you just did the math. How many cars are you going to have in that driveway? It only fits two. You can only get two in the garage, if you can get two in the garage. So you're going to have a bunch of cars in the street. You're going to have a lot of people trying to get, you can't hear me, I'm sorry. A lot of people, you know, trying to get through the streets. My kid almost got run over a couple of times. Just two weeks ago, there was a, uh, a deaf kid who, who almost got hit by a car and, and fell, got hurt. Uh, and the car just took off on him. So, you know, these, these are some of the issues. Life safety is very inexpensive uh, for the city to deal with. So, life safety issues is what I'm looking for now. Thank you, Paul. Joe raised his hand. Um, it's not necessarily the most pressing issue because the most pressing issue is the accomplishment of the of Claremont's master plan over time. That's the biggest block we're moving up the hill. But one that's getting a lot of light and heat right now is the definition of affordable housing and the growth in apartment communities. There's a, a moratorium that was just resolved yesterday, I think, for a six-month moratorium on the building of multi-family homes. And that means that definition city is three families and above in one living structure. It's getting a lot of attention because different people are concerned about the kind of folks who move into apartments. Are they transient? Are they short term? The demand on city services? What's that going to be? And how do we keep turning these things over? At the same time, we've got independent business people who allow it to buy land and build structures. So that issue is, is I think, Claremont City Council did a reasonably good job of trying to figure out how to deal with it, they said stop for six months. Thank you. Nick? Did you guys maybe guess what our pressing problem is in Mount Dora and that's parking? <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying, we're trying to get that thing all fixed up so we can have Ollie down there at one time and have a lot of parking spot. But uh, just, just for a, a quick uh, slide on that, uh, the city manager and I, since 2016, were negotiating with the owners of the post office property. And uh, they wanted to lease it to us. We wanted to buy it. And so for three years, we went back and forth, back and forth with them. So finally, we told them we just couldn't come up with the lease arrangement that they were looking at. It wasn't beneficial, financially beneficial to the city. So we, you know, we stopped the negotiation process. They turned around and sold the building a week later. And after we've been offering for three years to buy from them. So it was uh, very disconcerting from that standpoint that they did that to us. But 
we're in negotiations with other entities throughout the city to hopefully, within a year, these things take time, but eventually, well, hopefully within a year, we can have an announcement about where we're going to put a nice parking garage in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I believe that, that Claremont is the victim of its own success, specifically in transportation. Claremont's unique in that it's constricted by federal, county, and state highways, with very little control over any of the roads within Claremont, at least the major roads. I really, really hope, no matter who gets elected to the city council in Claremont in this election, we reach out and better communicate with the county commissioners of our needs. It seems that, that our requests are basically just sloughed off. I don't understand why, other than there's just no real communication between the two entities. We need relief, and we need the county to be stepping up, including a gas tax. Thank you. Thank you. Evo? Yeah, so I mean, Joe and, um, Joe and Jim definitely hit up on a lot of it, right? And I was going to say mainly for the most part economic development. And that obviously constitutes growth and obviously constitutes Claremont's master plan as well. Um, the master plan has a, it's got a lot of good things in it, but at the same time there's a lot of things that are a bit more expensive and things that we need to be smart about in regards to the money that we're paying. Uh, I know most of you guys who have driven in and out of Claremont have seen the two uh, watchtowers that are sitting up there. And uh, over $400,000 that's going to be spent on that. So it, it's definitely things like that that we need to look at and we definitely need to reassess. Also, when we're talking about economic development, Claremont actually does not have a true economic development director right now. Uh, our previous director, uh, Shan Smith, actually stepped down around two, two years ago or so. And now the job is being held by two different people or two different positions. So I think we definitely need to open up. Uh, uh, another economic development office and, and definitely need to have somebody whose sole purpose is to work on and work with small businesses as well as working with our county commissioners and our other uh, uh, elected officials as well. Yes, Mike. So um, even though I'm not running, I'm going to give you a little quick thing on Groban's side. I, the question to me is one that's hard to answer. I was really thinking about it up here, but the issues you started to hear raised, workforce housing, it's a dire need within this area as a whole. We just brought a new uh, plant in with Kroger, going to bring 350 jobs to the town. How do we how do we put up housing for them? How do we have schools that are adequate to, to service that community? We have to work with those. We're getting all these new places. We have limited water. How are we going to deal with the water supply? We think we have lots of water because we're surrounded by it, but, but water is a critical infrastructure piece that we are starting to run up against caps on it in lots of different ways. Um, firstly, we have a problem downtown with our state Route 50. Back in the day, Cup or the, uh, the, the representatives were coming out of Grover, they were the power, and they made that route run right through the center of town because back in the 1930s, having that road come through town was great. It was a great economic thing. Now i got 1,900 to uh, 2,000 trucks a day that come through on the corner, so I can't do anything with my downtown for economic development. So I think it's not one problem, but there's a lot that have to be worked together to solve out the issues we're going to face. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to move on to the next question, if I could. Or, go ahead, Alan. I'll make it quick. Montford is a bed and breakfast community. We understand that from Orlando. I think most of Lake County is that, too. We are not a major industry, heavy industry, or light industry. The county commissioners are trying to work on that. Our big problem is growth. We will fight growth. We listen to problems up in Eustis and Sorrento and the Red Wing, these lots, 40 by 60. Growth has to be controlled, and it's a hard thing for developers to say no to them. Whether it's a vicious circle, you start getting impact fees for higher density, that's great. 10, 15 years now, when your roads are shot, who pays for that? Not the developers. The impact fees are designated for certain things. They're gone. It's the residents, the taxpayers. Now, that all of a sudden, you're forcing this august people right, to raise your taxes. If you say no, no means no. We've developed our book in Montbird. Developers, you're going to get a half acre. You can fight and scream all you want. That's the, if the 
aesthetics of Mont Verde. We want it that way, we'll keep it that way, we'll fight that way. We wish Claremont and Mineola would do the same. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to move on to another question. This is directed at the candidates for the city of Tiberias. Candidates for the city of Tiberias, why have a bond issue for a performing arts? Is that a fiscally conservative position? Anybody want to jump on that? I'd say no, it's not. The Performing Arts Center has gone too far in the city of Tiberias. It should never have went to, to where it's at now. The money never should have been spent on consultant fee, on a study. It was a grandiose idea that it was always going to be too expensive, and it's not feasible and fiscally responsible for the city of Tiberias and the taxpayers and the residents. So that's my stance on the Performing Arts Center. Actually, the, the smart thing the council has done has been to put it up for the vote. So hopefully the voters will vote their wish not to spend the dollars on it if that's what their wish is. At the current time, according to the budget director for the city of Tiberias, the city of Tiberias has $65 million of debt. They're getting ready to add $8 million more for a public works building. And the Performing Arts Center is another $27 million. That adds up to $100 million in debt. And if you ask me, for a city of 17,000 people, $100 million in debt is just ridiculous. Uh, I just want to say that I don't think we need attractions in Tiberias because I think Tiberias is the attraction. I don't think we need that. Thank you, David. Yes, yes, sir. Troy. Yes, the Performing Arts Center has been something that's been kicked around by various councils for probably the past eight years. Um, this city council, two years ago, uh, originally we were told that we were going to try to go into partnership with a college or something. Uh, at the time, we were uh, looking at $120,000 for a study to be done. Uh, that came back to council after the uh, the college decided not to go in, go through with that. Uh, I voted no against uh, coming up with the other $60,000 to do the $120,000 study. Uh, the rest of the, the other, uh, three other council members voted to go, in, go through with that study. So the study was done, there was a large, it was a large amount that came back to the, the project. We told the designer that they needed to go back, that was just way too high, they came back with an amount of $27 million. Now, I can see the economic benefits that a performing arts center could possibly bring, but then when you look at the cost that it is to the citizens, that's what I had a problem with, and that's why we put it to the voters to make that decision, because that's not something that can be made by five council members. If, if, I, if I may? Yes, you may. I'm the question of performing arts in various. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great concept, problem, and I think it's great that we're taking to the voters. The biggest problem is that's been overlooked is the long-term cost factor. Is it ever going to pay for itself? That's the question. It, yeah, it's great for involving the community, the college, the school board. It's got potential, college, but is it worth the cost? That's a question everybody in Tiberi's got to ask. Thank you, James. Anyone else? Very, very good. I'll move on to the next question. This one is directed at Nick Jerome. <coughs> My Mount Dora business taxes are going up. Why do you need this after adding new fire tax? Business taxes. <coughs> That's the question. I don't think we raised any specific business tax. I know the different places in town have their the tax rates have gone up, not the tax rate has gone up, but their tax bill has gone up because on account of the property values went up at a higher rate than most of the other cities in the in the city and around in the county. The one of the reasons that uh, Mount Dora is a little different position than some of the other uh, communities here is uh, right now is our um, uh, commercial values. We do not have as much commercial values as a lot of the other cities do. So one of the things that we're doing is looking at our Wolf Branch Innovation District and some of the other areas of our economic development and our growth patterns that we do have on 
on the, on the route to 441, the expansion there, the Triangle District, the Highland Street area, plus the Wolf Ranch Innovation District, which is going to bring in a lot of development over there as far as some commercial growth. And with that, we should be able to keep our tax rate, our tax millage rate on a downward, bring that downward in the future years. Thank you, Nick. Very good. The next question goes to any candidate that's willing to, act, to answer. Will you pledge not to raise property taxes, including going to the rollback rate? Will you oppose fire assessment taxes? I will. In fact, we did that in video. We reduced, we reduced the tax rate when we implemented the fire assessment rate. And the concept of the fire assessment fee, I work kind of hard on because, in, in my opinion, the fire department ought to be funded separately from the general fund so that it's never affected by the downturn in the property values or the restriction of the state in terms of how much it can raise the millage rate. Right now, we have a $59 fire assessment fee. It doesn't cover the total cost of the fire department. Uh, we're going to forward that for this coming year. But ultimately, my goal in implementing the fire assessment fee was to fund the fire department individually. I'd love to do it with the police department, but there are restrictions on that. Very good. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, Nick. I'll take it real quick on there. Because we did raise our fire assessment fee this year and the $219 from the $50 rate from the past. The $50 rate was used for two years to fund two brand new fire trucks for the city. And, uh, but this new one is to, is to fund three new fire stations that are desperately needed in the city. We have one building that is almost totally getting ready to fall down. And the age is, and the condition of the building is really bad. It needs to be replaced. We have reports and everything on that to be, that, that was looked at. We have another station that is being shared with the police department. It is in a bad spot also with that, so we're building a station, a separate station for that over on Lemon. And then the east side of the town is also where the growth is going to be happening, is, is uh, targeted also for another station over there. We have two under contract now, and the third one is being negotiated on for the site on that. So our fire assessment fee is being used for brand new fire stations and equipment to go into those stations. Thank you, Nick. I want to add to, uh, to what Joe was saying. You know, I'm not really here to fight with him or anything. You know, he, he did, a, did a great job. He's there 10 years. Uh, but as I said before, I'm, I'm, I work for the fire department in, in uh, uh, with the park, Orange County Fire, fire Rescue. And um, I can tell you that, you know, just implementing some of these uh, fire, one on one fire safety codes and standards, the, the, uh, the fire department could actually generate uh, revenue from it. Uh, we probably won't even have to put up a tax fee. So uh, if, if we get the fire department on board to, to go ahead and, and, and actually, you know, permit and uh, give them the, the uh, authority having jurisdiction to go ahead and, and do this, they could, they could generate their own revenue uh, for permitting. So we wouldn't have to raise any uh, fire tax fee. Thank you, Paul. Yes, Alan. Town of Longburger had the same issue, but many of our sister bigger cities have. And we've moved our fire out of our, our general budget, which is a hard thing to do. We're at eighty dollars for our assessment, but we still, as a council, we're doing our budgets now. We had to, we still have to supplement the fire department. There's a lot of things in the fire department that we have. Most cities, I can speak, do not have control over. A lot of the federal regulations that come down. You've got no vote in it. When they tell you your tires got to be changed every X amount of thousand miles, whether that engine sits there or not, bingo, there's six grand right out the door. Somebody's got to pay for that. We found that our voters and our residents have a problem with the fact that it's like a dump. Everybody wants a dump, needs a dump, but they don't want it in your backyard. Everybody wants the fire department, but they don't want to pay for it. But yet when the fire bell rings and your house is on fire, you're sure glad they show up and the EMS service comes with it. So there's a cost you have to realize. Look, it costs to be alive. Are you willing to pay it? Thank you. <laughs> Nobody only, else only comment on that question? I'll move you. on to the next one. <laughs> this is another audience question to all. Anyone interested in answering it? It says, are you 
or are you not in favor of using your elected position to advocate or oppose causes that have nothing to do with your position as an elected official? Can you repeat that again? <laughs> My answer is yes and no. Good <laughs> news. So you're trying to say, or as an elected official, you're willing to stick your nose in other people's business that you don't belong in? I would say no, I'm not. I'm not sure where that came, that came from. This audience, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joe. I, I think it's an answer. official has responsibilities and hopefully integrity, but the use of his office for other interests that are not associated with why they got elected to that office, and using that office to leverage other issues, I think is almost unethical and wrong. However, it doesn't mean that an elected official can't take personal interest in, as I do, in disabled veterans or the homeless, whether I'm an elected official or not, unless I'm carrying a big sign that, hey, I'm on the city council, therefore do this. Um, there's a fine line between the ethics on that question and not, and I'm not even sure I answered the question correctly, because I'm not sure I fully understood it. Thank you, Joe. How about? I, I, my take on it is, you know, if there's a conflict of interest, you know, you should obviously use yourself and you know if it's uh, if, it, if it's you're working for the people like I said before you're working for the people the people aren't working for you you know you were elected and you were put in this position to serve the people so sir don't don't go after your own personal interest or your own personal gain do what's best for the city and, and work hard so. thank you Rebel. yes Alan uh, once again Alan Lumber for you um, <laughs> there, there are social issues that I think you need to get involved with separate your personal from your political life and we all have issues personally I'm going through one in our 180 district which doesn't affect us per se it's actually the city of Claremont where rural Lake County that the county commissioners just worked on this past week it's toxic waste dump that EPA has not played around with for 34 years and piddled with it I know the stuff that's in there I've seen it firsthand I'm watching on the wall I was interviewed with uh, Rick Scott, Senator Scott's people a couple weeks ago, and they asked me, are you an advocate or a you know, lobbyist or something? I said, no, it's the right thing to do. And I said, if you know of an issue that's wrong and you don't do anything about it, you're just as bad as guilty as the party that created the issue. So I think there's a, a line there where you have to step up the plate and say, it's not in my backyard, but it's sure going to affect people. And that's what you've got to go by. Very good. Anyone else jump in on that one? Yes, Walter would. Well, I would just say that if an issue comes up that the city has no business being involved in, especially when it's somebody else's uh, decision to be made, that they just shouldn't get involved in the first place. Thank you, Walter. Very good. I'm going to move on. Yes. I was going to add a, a caveat to that. Well, on my background, I spent 25 years in the, in the military there, and, and as an officer in the, in the military, I had to many times not take a position on things outside. In other words, it, it's to be apolitical, if you could, with, with things. But that doesn't mean that you turn away and become immoral or forego the moral imperatives that may face you. So there's not a good, simple answer to that, but I think it does become a problem when you start becoming an advocate uh, and using your position to force that advocacy out. So you should think very carefully as to how that works, and, and, and I think Walter and, and others have put it, my job is to serve the populace to which I've been elected to serve, and, and, and to listen to what their, what their issues are, and to try and champion those issues for them as best I can. So not my issues, but how their issues work. So I would just say it's something that Elected officials have to be very careful of in, in moving forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Before I move on to the next question. This one is for Mount Dora. It says, what plans do you have specifically for the youth of the community? Recently, the baseball fields 
were left off of the Lincoln Park focus groups and the bathrooms were overflowing for an entire season into the concession stand and sidewalks. Why won't the city approve netting between the fields? How much injury must occur? Yes. That's a question that was longer than my answer was <laughs> No, the, uh, well, we're, we're in constant with the constant contact through our leisure services uh, department, which handles all those issues uh, with them. And when they, we have uh, items that are addressed to us, we take our steps to go out there immediately and take care of the issues that, that, that are affecting. The netting that they're talking about, in between the fields is long. We have a whole series of fields out there in Lincoln Avenue area. And down the middle is an open pathway. So a lot of times uh, we put uh, fencing behind all of the um, the batting areas uh, extended the fencing out over to help block any foul balls from going over. Occasionally, uh, somebody can hit a ball, it's going to go out from one field, and it's going to land over to the middle area. And they were after, a couple years ago, they talked about putting the netting over this walkway. They came back to me last year and says, no, they, got this, they, they put the netting behind the stands, or behind the batter's areas, and that was corrected the issue for them. Now this year, I think somebody got hit with a ball coming over into that the wall plate. So we're going to be looking at that again and seeing about that. But again, it's one of those small tracks we've got to get in the budget and part of the plan. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Very good. good question. Next question. For any city not making videos of meetings, will you work to fund and improve transparency by implementing videos of meetings and post online. Can I take that for Vance? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. And the video guy asked that. Well, here's the thing. It's a great idea to do that, but that would mean that they would have to put the budget, the number in the budget, which would yeah. increase the dollar, so we don't want to do that. Correct? Out of $74 million? We don't, we don't want to do that, regardless of how much it is, right? <laughs> then we would not have the interaction either of the folks in the audience, and I think that's really important to have. I think if we continue with technology, the people can sit in their, in their living rooms in their pajamas and watch the city council meeting or any other meeting, you have no interaction. So, so where do we have that if it's all videotaped? That's Besides just what I guess. Him. I'm sorry? We have him. We don't need exactly. to. Exactly. I'm not going to do it anymore. I see an issue with the videotaping the city council and making sure everyone has the resource to go find out what happened. Uh, if you're not able to make a meeting because it's at an inconvenient time because you're working late, I think it's very nice that you can go online on YouTube and watch the city council. I think it's very important. I think it's a good thing. So, I don't see any doubt. Yes, John. I would support uh, the some reservations, live video presentations of city council meetings. I think it involves the entire city more. I think Claremont has a lot to sell. There's a lot of things that go on. There are an awful lot of award ceremonies at the city council meetings. And a lot of the public doesn't know about performance of the staff, employees, fire department, uh, awards given to the, the police department. I think that's a thing for Claremont to see show to the citizens. I would support that. You're going to have some issues with people getting on camera for the first time in their lives. But that, that is controlled by our mayor with a three-minute clock, which works really well. So the, the meetings proceed in a lot disciplined fashion. But I think promoting yourself as a city council and as a city is a plus that you would do it. Hello. I mean, it provides for true transparency. Uh, a lot of times cities will have minutes or will have abridged versions where they give you some type of information, but they leave some things out or they leave some things out just for the sake of uh, being brief. Uh, having video and actually allowing to see what happens, who's talking, what they're saying, how long they're saying allows for true transparency and accountability. You're allowed to say, oh, you know, Claremont recently had an issue with the boat ramp. Somebody on the council said they said one thing, another person in the, in the audience said they didn't. How do we, who do we know is lying and who's not? Having a video, having that transparency would be able to discern who is talking, who isn't, and actually give people the answers they're looking for. Thank you, Abel. Alan had a stand up. Yeah, we, um, my county commissioner, Sean Parks, always chides me because I'm one of the three people he knows that actually stays up at night and watches Blake County Board of Council Commissioners. <laughs> 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 
problem I think which most, most towns do. We sent out all the meeting notices on a web page and everything, and I got neighbors that come up to me and say, when you pass that ordinance? I said, six months ago there was a first reading, a second reading, a third reading. If you don't pick up the piece of paper that says town council is coming, these are the issues, are you going to actually stay up at 9 o'clock at night and watch the reruns of your city council? It's kind of a hard issue. Uh, with budgets being tight, we kind of say, do we want to invest in, in video and audio for 70 people to watch it, or would we rather use it for a service that can be used to actually benefit the community per se? But Tim, I actually do watch you, and you're doing really good up there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, who, who was next? I'm Tro yes. Troy. Yes. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, you know, the city of Tiberi, that's something that we've definitely looked into, but we're in the same boat. I mean, how many people are really going to watch the, the video? Is it really cost effective? Plus, with the ADA requirements that you have now, it's not a matter of just shooting the video and putting it online. I mean, it is a cost effect. I mean, it's a very, very costly thing that you have to do in order to meet these new ADA requirements. I mean, we're having problems right now with uh, you know, the website. Eustace you have, does it. Have people that, you know, Leesburg does it. And, you know, they have these lawsuits that they're suing cities <coughs> that aren't being ADA compliant. So that's one of the big issues that we're having right now is trying to, you know, find out what's the best way to deal with the ADA compliance when it comes to videos. Paul, were you up? Yeah. Uh, I'm for it. I, I know that uh, the city of Minio, I know, I know that we have a camera. You see the red light. I'm on the planning and zoning committee, by the way. I didn't, I didn't say that in the intro. I've been there for six years on the planning and zoning committee with the city of Mignola. Um, and I can tell you when I read the minutes uh, and we go approve them, lots of times I look at that and I say, you know, what happened to the conversation? How was it? But I understand that the people that take the, the minutes, you know, they have problems sometimes. They don't catch everything, whatever. And that's why the camera, the video, would, would, would capture everything. You know, and so I, I, I believe that that's, that's something that people should take advantage of. I think. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. I have actually discussed this with the city manager down in Gray a couple of times over the past 18 months, two years. And as someone said, I, I couldn't see who was speaking, there is a major cost to any municipality that wants to begin to videotape or live stream their meetings because of ADA. But people like Vance and Thankfully, we have a female Vance now in Claremont, Danny. Uh, who, who is videotaping. And the value of videotape is not to find out who's lying and who isn't, or who wasn't paying attention. It causes some civility in the meeting, because everybody that's talking knows that the world is watching, and they can hit rewind, and see you flub over and over and over again. <laughs> if, we, if we had a Vance, we would not have some of the shenanigans that we've been having the last several years in Claremont's council, which is an embarrassment right now. Well, you can tell everybody's age around here, there's no such thing as videotape anymore, so. <laughs> It's all digital. Uh, so we, we started we started uh, doing some live streaming, and uh, so we put it on hold because we were informed by some attorneys, and because uh, our PIO officer went to some of these meetings, and they assured a lot about uh, doing the live streaming. The attorneys really caution you to go on the live streaming unless you have your policy set in place ahead of time. Have a strong policy. You're going to need your attorneys to help you put, put a good policy together. And uh, that we're already having the budget, uh, in our budget, to uh, go back to live streaming. But we're going to make sure it's done right. And uh, Troy brought up the issue there about the ADA. Uh, ADA is a big thing on it. And you have to make sure the format that you're using is going to be able to, it's an easy way of doing it. Because you don't want your PIO officer spending two or three days doing the post captioning and different things you have to do for the ADA requirements to put it out. So there's a lot to it. We'll be doing it. We're going to get back into it again. Vans are at our place doing some videotape and asking that question. And uh, but we'll be doing it again. Thank you so much. We're about, we're running out of time here. We wanted to close at 8. I have one more question. If you guys would like to do one more question before we close. This question goes to the city of Tiberias. 
It says the Tavari City Council has antagonized rural county residents by annexing and appropriating high density developments not matching the neighborhood. Explain your stand on this and how to reduce conflicts. So that's directed to the city of Tavares. I'll take that. I serve on planning and zoning for the city of Tavares, and it's probably the uh, Shirley Shores item that the question is being talked about. And that was, the city was approached about annexing that area. And I was actually one of the only planning and zoning board members that insisted that the, the quality of life in that area should have been maintained, have a minimum of one acre properties in there, have a minimum of square footage under AC of 2,400 uh, square feet. Um, and that actually started the motion of having the one acre parcels less uh, crowding in that area to be able to complement that, that area there. And Tavares did not approach, it, it, was, it was the developer that approached the city. Thank you, Lou. Anyone else, Tavares? Sure. The city of Tavares, along with the county and the other cities and the county, have set up an ISBA for future growth and how to manage it. Well, the city said, okay, uh, the developer came to the city of Tavares, wanted to, you know, develop a property. And what they proposed was well within what the city had passed in their, you know, plan, planning zoning and our land regulations. The residents out there didn't like it because they said it didn't fit what they live in. And that's not true. Some of the houses out there are five acres from one house. Some are one-third acres out there off Shirley Shores. I know I drove the area. I grew up in that area for a little while. So it was well within what fit the whole area. It's just certain people didn't like it. And that's all it was, I believe, from listening to everything. And like I said, I'm for property rights and ownership. If you want to develop property under what the city is saying you have to do, which they were willing to do, they should be able to develop that property. That's what it is. Thank you. Anyone else? City of Tiberias. Yes, Troy. Yes, um, I too believe in uh, property owners' rights uh, to develop this property to the highest and best use. Um, and we do not um, automatically, we have voluntary annexation. If uh, you know, a group wants to be annexed in the city of Tiberias, and they meet the rules and regulations, then we allow that. But we do look into that. Um, and that area that's out there, we're also, this, uh, we are currently in our 20-year uh, comp plan redesign. We're doing that right now, and that's going to tell us the direction that the city of Tiberias is going to go in the next 20 years. And we're actually looking at adding an estate zoning of possibly a, you know, five-acre lots, and that might be something that fits in with that area out there. That's something that uh, we're looking at right now. Thank you so much. Anyone else? City of Tavares. Yes, Walter. I think something that often gets overlooked in these developments, like the one in Shirley Shores or the 240 apartment unit they just approved, uh, is is there any real demand in the marketplace for that product? Uh, when the Shirley Shores project first came online, they were proposing about $200,000 for a vacant two-acre lot, which is way out of whack with anything that's happening in the market. And that particular developer has a history of building developments and then that lots just sit there empty for years and years and years and years because nobody ever buys them. Uh, same with the uh, apartment complex. Uh, those are $1,500 to $1,800 a month rent. Uh, and are there that many people in Tiberias with that kind of income uh, that can really afford to live there. Uh, so I think growth, we need growth, but it needs to be responsible, and uh, we need to just you know, step back and take a look at some other factors. All right, last chance to vary. Well, everybody, that concludes our discussion. We need to keep a look at these guys. We have an election on November 5th coming up right around the corner. And uh, be sure to fill out our sign-up sheet if you want to be on distribution of the, the Republican Liberty Caucus here in Lake Sumter County. And I'd like to thank everyone, for the audience, for showing up.
and God bless everybody. Be well. Thank you, Mr.